Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. For countless parents, the journey to unschooling has redefined childhood and transformed their family relationships. Are you curious? Together, let's explore what living and learning looks like without school. Hello, explorers. I'm Pamela Riccia, and it's the 3rd of August, 2022, as I record this intro. And this week, we're flashing back to episode 23, Learning to Read in Their Own Time with Anne Oman. Anne is a longtime unschooling mom of two grown children, and back in 2016, we had a lovely conversation about reading that I have referenced countless times over the years. When we spoke, she was working as a library director, giving her powerful insights and amazing stories to share about children learning to read. Anne shares her perspective on why children at school are expected to learn to read early, why unschooling children who aren't yet reading aren't lacking anything, how they play with the puzzle of reading every day, and so much more. And for clarity, I want to mention that Anne's oldest child is now known as Avery, using they-them pronouns. It was so valuable to dive deep into one of the most asked about topics in the unschooling world. I hope our conversation sparks an insight or two for you. And before we dive in, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has chosen to support the podcast through Patreon. (laughs) My goodness, I appreciate all my patrons so much. Whether this is your first month or you've been here for years, thank you, thank you, thank you. Your generous support is instrumental in keeping the podcast archive freely available to anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to join my community of patrons and scoop up some great rewards along the way, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And now here's my conversation with Anne. Hi everyone, I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Anne Oman. Hi Anne. Hi Pam. (laughs) I am really looking forward to digging into the topic of reading with you. I am so excited too. It's all I've been thinking about, even though I have a hundred other things going on in my life. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I really appreciate all the work you've done with me to set this up. I'm really looking forward to it. And as a bit of an introduction to those who may not know Anne yet, she has always unschooled her two boys who are now 25 and 22. She's been writing and speaking about unschooling for many years, starting her email list, Shine With Unschooling, back in September of 2004, so coming up on 12 years. I heard her speak at the Live and Learn conference that year and was, I believe, the first person to join her list when she got home and created it. (laughs) Yeah. Over the years since, she's become a very dear friend. She's also hosted conferences and gatherings over the years. And together, starting this year, we host the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit. So just as a first question, can you share with us a bit about your background and your family and how you came to unschooling? I would love to. And I've actually been writing about unschooling since 1998. And I love to say that because I love to pull out the 1900s. (laughs) (laughs) And that was, I was writing on the only online unschooling forum at the time, unschooling.com. And it's there where uh, we kind of got a core group of people. And that's where Kelly Lovejoy was inspired to uh, host the first Live and Learn Unschooling Conference in 2002, and I spoke at that. So I've been writing and speaking since way back then. And also, I've been a student of my children and how they learn through life simply from being who they are since the day they were born. And mostly because when Jacob was born, um, he did not accept any mainstream notion of what a baby should be like. <laughs> <laughs> he did not he did not read that manual that mainstream society was handing out and uh he let me know that he was going to be who he was here to be and I rejoiced in that and I was so grateful for that and I followed listened to celebrated and followed that and then Sam came three and a half years later and Dave and I had two amazing life gurus to follow and learn from that's a great way to uh, look at it, right? Cause it's uh, 
I know once my children were here and seeing um, them in action, they really let you know what it is that they needed versus, and it was so often so different from all the messages that com- were coming from outside. <laughs> Oh, exactly, exactly. Even from, you know, what the gifts I got at my baby shower, you know, nothing was <laughs> in my house because it was all about, you know, how to keep your baby at a distance and everything. And uh, so it's, it's cool. It's cool to follow the child and the child letting us know. Yeah, that's super. So let's shift to reading now. Um, school and by extension society is very laser focused on children learning to read as early as possible. So as a rural library di- director and unschooling parent, I would love to hear your perspective on how you've seen these reading expectations play out. Okay. Well, first of all, I love how you s- said rural library director. It's like the hardest three words to say together. <laughs> <laughs> But of course, when we have any expectations on our children and we don't trust in them to live and learn in their own way and in their own time, you know, they can feel that. So here we are, an entire society, which does include school and libraries where I work, collectively holding this expectation about children reading early and often And not only holding that expectation, but creating programs and incentives and rewards and punishments around this expectation. And if we back up to see why society does this, it's really obvious. We talked about this before. Schools need children to read. A quick Google search will tell us that children reading early has a direct correlation to academic success. Of course it does, you know. How can teachers teach children what they're expected to be teaching without children being able to read? The only method a classroom has of expanding a child's world is by way of reading. And there's lots of ways they they do that. Books, handouts, tests, what's written on the chalkboard. Do they use chalkboards now still? I don't know. (laughs) And some kind of board. (laughs) Some kind of board. Um, you know, it's all the written word. And so, yeah, we see how this equation is necessary. The equation being the expectation of early reading equals academic success. And the cool thing is that we as unschooling parents get to remove the academic success part of the equation because that's never our focus. Our focus is on the child and the whole child. So when you remove academic success, there's not an equation anymore. So the expectation of early reading falls away as well. And now we can allow the child to learn and grow and perceive the world in their own way, in their own time, and offer them the greatest gift we can offer our unschooled children, which is trust. And my view of all of this from a library perspective actually began years ago before I was a library director in 2002 Uh, Jacob was 11 and Sam was eight and the universe put an opportunity in front of me to start a parent child library program in our little local rural library. (laughs) And I said, I said yes to it because my kids were older and they didn't need me as often. And I wanted something that I love to do. And I also knew it was something they could join me in or not and be involved in with it involved with it as much or as little as they wanted to. And and yet from the very beginning to fund the program, I had to apply for grants and filling out the library grant forms made me want to just run back to my free unschooled 10 mountaintop acres at home. <laughs> you I know, can imagine. <laughs> We've never been able to fit our unschooling lives and our visions into standard forms, you know, and that's like making a resume. We have to get really creative, but this form didn't allow the space to do so. It had so much mainstream schoolish vernacular and they wanted uh, specific methods and the specific numbers I would reach and how many would be readers at the end of my project. You know, they wanted Mm -hmm. to see results. And it totally conflicted with my vision and desire to simply bring parents and children together in joy and in celebration of wonderful children's picture books and simple creative crafts. And therefore, my grant applications all got turned down, (laughs) probably because I didn't speak their language. 
But then a friend of mine uh, told me, uh, who was involved in me watching me do all this, she lives in New York City and at a summer home here, um, when her husband's mother died, she had left them uh, money to give to rural towns for, to promote literacy. And she knew me and she knew my kids. And she didn't want to give me the money to promote literacy. She wanted to give me the money to do what I do. And that's to share my joy and my appreciation of children and books. So thankfully for many years, she generously funded my parent-child library program. And because we were a little rural library and the library director trusted me, I had the freedom to create a program without society's expectations and pressure to make sure children were reading books or learning to read. So I had all these wonderful things happening where I didn't have any restraints placed on um, my vision according to society's expectations, which was fantastic. So I walked into that library with my knowledge of how children learn through joy and through life. And that's what I manifested, my vision of joy. It was funny because after my very first program, the local school support of parents did not return because they were not happy that I did not make their children sit and be quiet and listen to the story. Instead, I, of course, encourage children's interaction. I encourage their conversations. I encourage them to get up and point things out in the book. When I finish reading a book, I always wanted to know how they felt about the book. And they knew I wanted their honest opinion. And, you know, parents don't want to hear that. They want to hear that the child liked the book. So wow. even for the craft, I, I always said when I made the craft, I would say, this is what I made from these materials. You're free to make whatever you want from them. So that's the, you know, the whole feel of the library program and was cool as, as those disapproving parents dropped out in through the doors would walk parents who had driven from over an hour away saying one or both of the following things. I heard your story time was fabulous and, or I heard you homeschool your children without a curriculum. And I want to know more about that. <laughs> <So> <laughs> that was so awesome. And so my library program was basically filled with homeschoolers and unschoolers and a couple of parents who were going to send their kids to school, too, but who appreciated my joyful connection with their kids. And I had kids of all ages there because it was so family friendly, ranging from babies to Jacob, the oldest at 11 and then 12, 13 and 14 as we continued the program. And what was so beautiful was how we created this fabulous community. Jacob and Sam would sit in the back of the small children's room in little kid chairs and play their Game Boys. Yes. Was it Game Boys back then? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> 2002, maybe. Uh, and there was a young boy um, who idolized my boys, and he brought his Game Boy, too. He's 18 now. And I can still see the three of them sitting in the back of the room, quietly playing while listening to me read books, laughing at the books and commenting on them, along with all the little kids who were on the floor pillows and after the books were finished, you would just see this community, the smallest of children um, being read to by older children, being helped out on the computer by the older children, all ages doing the crafts together and helping each other, coming up with amazing things. And this was exactly why those grant applications and society's conversation about getting kids to read was a foreign language to me, because this is all I needed to create. I knew this from our own home, our own free unschooling home, the space of freedom and joy and trust. And so here I was with this early childhood literacy program, and it was filled with kids who couldn't read, even some of the older unschooled kids, and never was there one bit of focus placed on that. The focus was on their joy. So that was the first, my first foray into a uh, library world. And fast forward all these years later, when the universe put this opportunity in front of me in 2014 to be a rural library director. And I wanted this job so bad that I knew I could take whatever reading regulations the library system handed to me and make them my own. I knew that my presence there as an adult who celebrated children and saw them through the lens of joy would be valuable. And so I wasn't dreading checking off the quote literacy boxes. For a small example, this year's summer reading program theme, there's a theme every year, is on your mark, get set, 
read. (laughs) (laughs) After I groaned when I first saw that and I did some work on it, I kind of held on to it and I ended up making a fabulous flyer. And last week I was showing my board of directors my summer program flyer and I pointed out to them that kids understand when we're trying to get them in the library to read (laughs) and that's never been a it's never been a goal of mine so I want kids to come into the library and simply feel like they're happy at the library that they're seen and heard and so my flyer does have the tagline I earmark gets at read and that's where I describe my very easy reading program where kids can list any book they've read even if it's just one book and they put a thumbs up or thumbs down sticker next to it. So because I want them to know that I care again about how they felt about the book. That matters to me more than simply the fact that they read a book. And then on the flyer, I also have on your mark, get set, create. And I list the events where we'll be making things. I have on your mark, get set, explore. And I list the times where we'll be exploring cool science toys and games. I have on your mark, get set, watch a movie. On your mark, get set, eat ice cream for our annual ice cream social. <laughs> <laughs> and at the bottom of the page, I say, most importantly, on your mark, get set, have fun at the library. And that's what matters the most. And my board approved. <laughs> Yay. Yay. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that is so cool. The way you were able to, you know, it's something that we we learned to do over the years, right? Take um, the the conventional perspective, but see so much of the bigger picture for it. And you know, it, it doesn't mean we have to you know erase or get rid of that, but we can expand the vision so much more, right? That's it exactly. It I know, and that's that's it. Always takes an initial groan, and then yeah. then, the, then the expansion happens, and I'm like, oh, I can I can invite the rest of the world into the summer program, even though you know the library system is saying it's got to be this. But yeah, what we how can we not invite the rest of the world? That's what we do. Yeah. And, and speaking of uh, the kids that you're inviting into the library, I know since you started there that I've really enjoyed um, reading some of the stories that you've shared on Facebook about the school kids that come to the library and how you've seen their outlook on reading change um, over time. I was wondering if you could share some of those stories. I would love to. And I, I have three and they're all about the same little girl and I'm going to call her Jay. And I don't know, again, there's these are from Facebook, so I'm not sure of the order that they're in, but they're all really, really cool. This first one says, um, my nine-year-old foster care after school friend who can be very challenging at times in her quest to be seen, heard, and loved has been using our library search computer lately. She doesn't know what she's searching for. She types words into the search that she sees on the computer, like search. Yes, she'll type the (laughs) word search into the search. And then she'll type the word subject into the subject search. And she comes up with amazing things. The other day, she pulled every single nonfiction cat book we had off of the shelf. Her enthusiasm and excitement were so beautiful that it almost didn't even cross my mind that I would have to reshelve all of those books. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know how she found every single nonfiction cat book we have? She taught herself the Dewey Decimal System. She figured out on her own what the numbers after the book subjects meant. She didn't know how to look for them. It didn't matter because as soon as I heard her saying, going to the shelves and saying the numbers out loud, I left my desk and my work and I went to her and I asked her if she wanted some help. And yes, she did. And we started to look for the books together. Today, I walked by her on our search computer and again, she was typing subject into the search. I smiled. And then she started spelling things to me, asking me what they said. I just wanted to make sure today that she wasn't looking for something specific, so I asked her if there was something that she was interested in finding. She said, I am interested in finding, and then she took a scrap paper and pencil and wrote down these words and ran over and handed it to me. It said, Canada in pictures. And then she she then said, it's number 971. We went looking for it together. I pulled it off the shelf and she squealed when I showed it to her. That's my first story. Mm. <laughs> my second story, uh, let's see. 
uh, nine-year-old Jay brought a school library book t to me today complaining, I'm supposed to read this in 20 minutes or I'll be in trouble and I can't read these words. I asked, who told you that? Her foster mother. I looked at it. It was the most boring picture book in the world. It was about <laughs> wild ponies, which could be interesting, but this book was not at all. I thumbed through it and I told her it looked to me like it was a difficult book to enjoy. I pointed to a word, <laughs> I pointed to a word and I said, I don't even know how to say that word. I said, the fact that you can't read this has nothing to do with how smart you are. If you had a book you were interested in, you'd be able to read it because you'd want to read it. What about if I read this to you? Yes, that was fine with her. So I started. It was just too boring. <laughs> I started re while I was reading, I started saying blah, 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 blah. And then I was skimming. When I read the words, they were too boring. And when I read the words, Jay said, can you just say blah, blah, blah there too? <laughs> so, I asked, so I asked her, does it have to be this book? She said she chose it because she was in a hurry and she doesn't have another book. Um, we're in a library, I said. I said, let's go find you a book you will like. We did. She took it, left my side, and went to the table to read it. She was back very soon, laughing. She said, giggling, I have to read this to you. It's so funny. There were words she didn't know, but she figured them out because she loved the story. She was so into it. And she read the whole thing in less than 20 minutes and then read it again to me, laughing. That's my second story. Wow. <laughs> My third story is called Discovering Madeline. Madeline. Is that the book? Madeline? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Realizing I never said that word out loud. <laughs> <laughs> this one's similar to the other one, and it starts, she showed me the book the teacher gave her to read for homework. She trusts me to be honest with her about such things. I said it looked long and maybe a little interesting, but not very. We laughed. She opened it up and showed me a page and said, exasperated, oh, look at all these words. I asked her if she had to read that book. She said no, but she didn't have another. Again, I looked to my left. I looked to my right. Yep, we're both standing in the library. I suggested she start looking for another book. I told her I'd help her when I was done with my work. I wanted to give her some space first. She came back after a few minutes and showed me her book. Mad About Madeline, The Complete Tales of Ludwig Bemelmans. Yes, all of the Madeline books in one big treasure of a book. I expressed my joy that she discovered a book on her own. This is a huge thing that I believe strongly in, allowing children the space to discover in a library. She most certainly did not notice that there were just as many words in that book as in the homework book, and that's because she chose this book. Her heart was drawn to this particular book. And she was curious and enthusiastic about opening it up and reading it. She started reading on her own while I continued working. She was incredibly delighted. She was excited. She was in love. She would run over to show me pictures, to read an excerpt to me. And then she would stop reading, pick up the book, and walk around the entire library, hugging the book and singing, I love this book so much. <laughs> I was thrilled. I was laughing at her joy. I asked her, do you love Madeline? I thought she was in love with the character, and I love how clear she was in her answer. No, I love the pictures in this book, and I love the words in this book. She wanted to check the book out, but because of her home situation, uh, uh, she's a foster child, it was not a good idea. We found a special place to keep it there at the library where no one else would be able to find it and no one else would be able to check it out. And she knows her book is waiting there just for her whenever she comes in. The end. Yeah. I miss, <laughs> I miss her. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. Wow. What a just a beautiful glimpses into into the journey when it's in their control right exactly and 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 just the simplicity of what we all we need to offer them you know what i mean it's so simple and it's so 
downstream compared to, you know, schools just going against the flow and fighting and trying to get them to do this and this and this when, you know, look at what I offered her and it was completely just taken over with joy and ease. I, you know what I want, I wonder what I'd like to talk about actually is, is why is it that we, we see the society getting so caught up in reading by a certain age such that if they're not, the adults just seem to keep focusing on just that missing piece. They don't see the whole picture of the child. They just see not reading, not reading and not reading. Exactly. And that's, and that's, it just goes back to their requirement of having uh, reading be the only way they can teach basically. And, and that gets ingrained in parents and even unschooling parents have, uh, trouble letting that go sometimes, you know, and, um, children learn from the time they're young when they're free and trusted. And it's the same with reading. And yet, you know, once kids get to a school age, parents start to panic and see, uh, just go back to all they've ever known schools regu- schools requirements and uh, there's a I did a conference talk as you know at um, your conference and at a live and learn conference called this is where unschooling lives and this is available by the way on Pam's website um, and there's I have a short excerpt about Sam and his journey to reading um, because and I, I hate saying these words because it just sounds so negative and it goes against my whole focus. But Sam was a late reader um, and I talked a lot about it in that talk. And there's also my other talk, um, What's So Radical About Radical Unschooling, has a lot in it about Sam's journey to reading also. But this short excerpt here um, just describes our entire family's energy about it. I wrote... My son has been on this journey toward reading for years now, and the focus in our family has never been to get to the end point where my child is reading. Our lives were, as always, focused on his strengths, on his joy, his passions, all that he was and all that he could do. In our family, we allow the light of our children to blind us to what society may define as a lack. We don't see lack because our vision is filled with the glory of who our children are. And that's exactly how our lives have always been. And that's such a huge piece, right? That lack that everybody sees. So let's talk about how our kids have learned without reading. Cool. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Because it doesn't get in their way, does it? Exactly. And it's, it's, you know, it's just what I said, learning is everything they, it's in everything that they do. And um, with, I always felt with reading, I always called it a puzzle. And I feel like children are picking up pieces of the reading puzzle everywhere along the way. We're surrounded by words, signs, and, you know, the grocery store is filled with words and everything. And so they're picking up these pieces here and there throughout their lives. And they're either holding on to them or they're discarding them if they're not ready for them. And they're laying them down in a way that makes sense to them in that moment. And they might not be at a place yet, you know, where those pieces fit into the bigger reading puzzle picture. So they just continue to keep turning those pieces around like we get the pieces to fit into the puzzle. And uh, I've, I've witnessed that. I don't know, it, you probably have too, that it hasn't really kept our kids away from doing what they really want to be doing. And um, it's because we have this environment where they're celebrated for being who they are and we follow what they love, that they don't feel like, you know, it impairs them because they can't read. They'll go to a video game or a game or um, whatever that has a lot of reading in it and they'll just keep going forward and finding different ways to um, get the information they need. They're industrious when they really want to do something. You know, we haven't told them they can't do it because they haven't followed society's standard steps along the way to get there. We haven't led them to believe they need to learn the alphabet before they could make words. You know what I mean? So, um, uh, as you know from your kids, uh, our kids show us over and over how they're full-fledged participants in the real world. And Sam, uh, when I laugh every time I think of this, he was such a little kid and wanting to play Yu-Gi-Oh uh, card game in tournaments. And so we would drive him an hour away to these tournaments, and there were all these 
older kids, really big kids, like drinking two liter jugs of soda as their drinks. (laughs) (laughs) And there was little Sammy wanting to do tournaments with them. And nobody knew he couldn't read. And yet he was able to understand what the card said. And Jacob would stand there by his side side, and Sam would just look up to him if he needed help. And Jake would, you know, read the card to him. And, um, you know, those cards are very complex with very big words in it. And because he knew what the card would do, he would know what the card said. So... Yeah, you know what? I love that it's a piece because because we don't have the expectation and they don't feel the lack of not reading. They just take what they want to do and and use the skills that they have. You know, they do things in such different ways than we would. Um, I'm going to go back that second. And when reading comes up, they know that we'll help them if that's, you know, if they need some help to read something, you know, Jake standing there to help him out if he needed, they know that they have that support as well. Because I always remember, yeah, I always remember back um, when Michael was was younger and wasn't reading yet. And uh, he always, he really loved to play the game Clue. Right. And so, you know, me, analytic mind. Right. I've got I've got the clue sheets, you know, it's where you can tick off what people have asked, what you think people have. And I would offer I'd say, hey, Mike, you want me to because I'm pretty good at forgetting as well. <laughs> people will spoil. Uh, I'll tell my kids they can spoil me for a TV show or whatever, because by the time I watch it, I won't remember. No problem. <laughs> Because they want to talk about it. I'm, no, sure, tell me all about it. I won't remember. <laughs> but um, he never wanted me to uh, help him out with reading there. And he just, he used the skills that were, that he had at the time. You know, his memory was really developed, whether or not it was because he wasn't, you know, uh, uh, as part of not reading or whatever. You know, those other skills that they, um, that come more naturally to them, they those things are what they can rely on because it, nothing is is actually holding them back. Again, back to that lack word, and he would uh, win the games very regularly, having just memorized and remembered what you know people have asked, what clues he's gotten, and I was just always so flabbergasted by that. Yeah, yeah exactly. I've, yeah, I've always. There's- uh, and been in of their unreading minds. It's just, uh, it just seems like a more clear uh, picture of the world where it doesn't have all these labels on everything. You know what I mean? They can interpret everything in their own way and the way they're, they want to see the world instead of having it all labeled with words <laughs> and, and knowing what those words say. Um, it's so funny because just yesterday at the library, of course, this is what happens in our lives that I'm going to be talking about reading today. So I've gotten to tell patrons stories yesterday. Um, a woman came in and checked out some children's books. Actually, no, she bought children's books from our book sale that were left over. And she said to me, now, if I can only get my grandson to sit by me and read, that would be a major accomplishment. And I told her about how Sam never wanted to sit and read books. He, Jacob did. So we would come home with a stack of children's books and Jacob and I would sit and read and read and read. And Sam would be nearby playing and creating and destroying and imagining and moving and moving and moving. And he was also listening. And this is something else that, you know, another piece of um, how they're learning and absorbing that society tends to not see and forget about. Um, the way some kids learn differently or hear differently and retain things differently. And we've also had audiobooks going whenever we got into the car because everywhere, everything around here you want to go to is at least 20 minutes away. So like you were saying about, you know, Michael's mind, it was the same. I felt the, the way about the Sam's comprehension and memory of every specific of audiobooks. I, I mean, he can still quote Maniac McGee, you know, from, and he was so young when we listened and it's just, I'm in awe. And you know what? That was one of the big challenges for Joseph when uh, he was in school. And the teachers, just his teachers really couldn't get it because they were sure he wasn't paying attention um, Mm. because he would be busy playing with some pencil, eraser, something, something. You know, he would be busy doing things. And then 
You know, I remember the principal telling me a story of she walked by. He looked like he wasn't paying any attention. She pulled him out, asked him what the teacher was talking about. And he like told her word for word. <laughs> <laughs> and they were just like, I don't know what to do. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, so it's yesterday, just. I, uh, there was a young adult in the library. Well, there was a, another little girl who is an unattended child in the library and I had pulled out I had that thinking putty I forget what uh, the brand name is it but I love this is the magnetic stuff and I asked her if she wanted to play with it with me so we were playing with it and then this young adult walked by and he was drawn to it and so I kind of just kind of planted some seeds I'm like I'm like I play with this when I need to listen to something and I you know I feel like I'm going to get bored if I just sit there and listen and if I have this to play with then my brain works better. And I just was wanted to instill these little things um, kind of validating that they have to sit when and listen when things are boring and <laughs> and let them know that it's okay to feel like you want to be doing something else. So we, the three of us are just playing with this putty and stretching it and everything, and it was it was the greatest experience. And they both understood that hey, yeah, this doing this would really help, you know, with how my brain works. Yeah, and then there's the other piece where how. Um society seems to value books and book learning over all the other ways, you know, you know, we would have so much fun going like to the science center and museums and everything and the hands-on exhibits and, uh, uh, what we talked about on the Q and A a couple episodes ago, um, YouTube University, Anna called it. There's just so many ways to learn things beyond the written word that it real that you know, it, not reading does handicap kids in school uh, as they get older because that's the only way that information is given to them. Yet when you have the world that you can uh, explore, there's just so many other ways that that kind of information is available and it really does not put you behind. Exactly. And, and you know, still like it's such an important part also is how we uh, exactly that we don't place an emphasis on it. And I'm surrounded by parents who, are just praising their child when the child reads something, you know, at the library. And, and then of course a child gets shamed when they're not reading. And, you know, it's so foreign to us in our lives and not only is it not good, but it, it's hijacking their own experiences, you know, where our children are allowed to own their own experiences. And again, their interpretation of everything. And it's, uh, we are continuing living our lives, being surrounded by the written word and having conversations. And there's so much more going on. And even with learning and all the other ways, there's still those pieces of that reading puzzle that they are picking up when they are ready to pick it up and placing it. And maybe the whole reading puzzle isn't complete yet, but those pieces are constantly being picked up when they're ready. Oh, I know. It's so beautiful to watch over the years. And I wanted to ask you about something because this is something that I've seen over the years. Um, and and I noticed it, you know, with, uh, well, Joseph was, was reading by the time he left school, although he was reading at a much more advanced level than they saw at school, right? Because they have grade level books and they were not interesting. And as far as the teachers were concerned, he was just, you know, barely reading. Yet at home, he was reading 100 page printouts of walkthroughs for video yeah. games written by adults, right? <laughs> exactly. But uh, anyway, so I've noticed that um, unschooling children are often more apt to call themselves readers once they're comfortably reading adult level books versus those grade level things. Have you seen that too? Oh, definitely. Most definitely. In fact, like in the uh, excerpt from my talk that I did, I believe I say, you know, Sam's not reading super strongly right now because as I've been saying, it's, he's, he's got a lot of the pieces of the puzzle there and it's, they're just not all there. And, Yet, um, yeah, once the pieces are all there, they can dive into anything. Jacob was nine, uh, I guess, when the first Harry Potter book, I think Jacob was almost nine. And we were in a bookstore, and he was so drawn to it. And I picked it up, and I looked at it, 
um, knowing he was sensitive about cruelty in books and I was reading what it was about and I was like, ah, I don't know about this book, Jake. I'm like, this, this boy's made to live in a cupboard under the stairs. I don't know. So I said, let's check it out from the library before we buy it to make sure you like it. And so we did. And, you know, there was no waiting list for it back then because I had <laughs> heard of it before. It was like the day it came out. And so we got home with it. And I apparently was not available enough to read it to Jacob as much as he wanted me to read it to him. And so one time I got up from reading to make dinner or whatever, and he took the book and just kept on reading it himself. And he didn't know he could read, and he just started reading that book. And Sam, uh, the first book he read on his own, I believe, was the graphic novel Watchmen, which is an adult book also. And that was also really interesting because it revealed a lot about how Sam's brain worked and maybe why other pieces of the puzzle weren't fitting. They weren't the right pieces at all. He needed, you know, some visual with it. So that was really cool. Oh, that is awesome. fascinating. And I will link in the show notes because uh, Lissy's reading story is intricately woven with Harry Potter as well. <clears throat> so that, that might be interesting for some people to read. Um, I have a question for you. Have you had anyone judge your kids for not being able to read? Um, well, as an unschooling family, as I've said this so many times before, we've just kind of lived our lives when we've been around other people and not allowed any space for judgment to be inserted into our lives. We've always, um, you know, focused on our passions, our interests and what we're doing when we're around other people. Um, so for the most part, no, because there was no space for that. But I do remember one instant when we were kind of nervous about um, uh, Sam might be being judged. Uh, we had, it was actually, I hope she doesn't listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> the library director who gave me the job as the, um, for the parent child library program, um, her daughter, she and I were such good friends and she was older than Jacob, maybe by four years or so. God, she, no, can't be that old now. Anyway, um, this was when they were all very young and, um, we had become good friends and laughed together and everything. And so we invited her to the river to go kayaking once. So she came to spend the day with us. And after we had been kayaking, we were in our cabin. We were going to play apples and ap apples to apples. And um, we all kind of had a meeting before and how, you know, Sam might not want to reveal that he can't read. And I just said, OK, I, I'm uh, thank you for telling me you're sensitive to that. I'll work it out so that we can still play this game. And so I'm, you know, I'm making food and they're setting up the game and everything. And I'm saying all these things we're talking. And I said, oh, somebody um, needs to sit by Sam who can help him read his cards. And then I just continued to talk and create and stuff and didn't allow any space for any judgment in that moment. But I know she probably, you know, was struck by the fact that Sam wasn't reading his cards. And yet she saw how it just kind of flowed, you know, went right along with just one simple thing about Sam, you know. And she knew all these things about Sam with having spent the day with him. Sam loves kayaking. Sam's really funny. Sam's hungry for lunch, you know. And so this thing that Sam couldn't read just kind of went in and out as one of those things. And that's how the game progressed. Sam got help reading his cards and... Uh, she went home that day and her mother reported to me that uh, Brianna had said it was the best day of her life. So that's how small uh, that piece was in the entirety of the day and which is really exemplifies how small it is in our lives, you know. Yeah, I think that's been one of the, the biggest pieces for me too, out and about, you know, with the extended family, with with uh, other people in the world. Um for those pieces that we know don't match up with the more conventional uh, lifestyle is is to live it in front of them, you know, not leave the opening because, mm -hmm. I mean, there's an energy to it, too. Right. Where you kind of say something, the way you phrase it, and then as you almost like sit back and people 
feel like you're kind of expecting them to say something. Whereas right. if you come up and it's just, just a fact and, and I'm sitting beside him and I'm helping him with that and we're all having fun and this is how we do it. You're just, you're showing them that this, this other way is totally, totally fine. I mean, that has, that's worked so well for me over the years. Yeah. I had a similar incident yesterday with that young adult in the library. Um, he was talking about how he needed to do the five hour driving class to get his license. And I happened to have a poster in my foyer and I said, come with me to my foyer. So I showed him the poster and I made a copy of it for him. And, um, then I said, Jacob might be in your class if you take this. And he's like, what Jacob, your son. And I said, yeah. And he goes, how old is he? I said, he's 25. And he said, he, he's not, he doesn't have his license yet. And I said, you know, very casually, no, he hasn't felt the need to. I know people have gotten their license when they're 40. He said people drive him. He, his brain works differently. And we talked about how people learn things differently. And then Jacob walked over from his house next door and we all started talking about it. It's just that energy in which you say, you know, their shock value uh, doesn't go anywhere. It kind of bounces off of us and we still stick to what's really important in seeing the entire person, not just this one small piece of what they define as a lack. Then we don't. Yeah, it, it is all about, we've had those same kind of driving things come up here and there too, because uh, Michael's in the process of doing his and, and he's 18, he'll be 19 next month, you know, versus a 16 where everybody throws their kid in the car and says, you need to learn to drive so I don't have to drive you everywhere. <laughs> exactly. Well, and plus kids want to drive away from their parents too. So, you know, they yeah. want to their parents and we do so many things together and so it's I I didn't need feel the need to list all the reasons to explain myself I wanted to give him information though so that he could take it out and maybe examine the way he judged so quickly you know yeah because that's it if if you start like explaining yourself then then that can um, put the moment more confrontational, right? Because then they feel the need to explain themselves. But just as things come up in conversation, because so often they're at, they're curious, you know, and uh, just having a normal conversation with them. And just to say, Michael's my youngest and he'll be the first child to drive. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's not something Liz, Lissy actually started. She did her uh, the first stage. It's a graduated license here, but then she moved to New York City, and there's no need for driving there. And you know, and it's not something Joseph's ever been interested in. When we drive him, when he comes places with us, you know, he gets motion sick, and ten minutes into it, he's not feeling well. So driving isn't something that interests him either. Mm-hmm. So it's all individual, right? It is. It's so cool. Yeah. And so for our last question, I was wondering how you feel now when you look back at Sam's journey to reading. Oh, you know, Sam is one of the most intelligent people I know. I wish everybody listening here could hear Sam explain the entire Star Wars series to me. (laughs) (laughs) He just has... Uh, his brain is able to retain so much information, so many details. And, oh, my God, something happened yesterday with a TV show that I watch that Sam doesn't even watch and yet had obviously been in the room when I was watching it and made a reference to something years ago and connection. And I honestly believe that the non-reading mind is... A bonus. And I don't want to say that because some people do read early. So I'm just going to rephrase that and say trusting in children to learn when they are ready because you can't push that and you don't want to push that. You want to look at it and celebrate it, celebrate the mind that can see things uh, in its own way, interpret things in its own way. And as we've been talking about, there are just so many ways for them to be in the world fully and still not be, uh, you know, have all of the pieces together in the reading puzzle. Right now, you know, Sam is never without a book. And recently started listening to audiobooks again, and we had a conversation about it. And he was talking about how much of a gift it is to have someone read books to him. That's really cool. 
And I just have one little story. When uh, Sam is a chef, and when he had a job as a cook at a really nice restaurant in Hudson, New York, I would find out found out that his favorite author, Neil Gaiman, was in Hudson with his wife Amanda Palmer, <laughs> and they were they were doing a tour of upstate New York independent bookstores. And I'm like freaking out. I'm texting Sam saying, Neil came in and Amanda Palmer and Hudson leave work and go see them. And he's like, uh, yo mom, I work in a restaurant. I don't see daylight. I don't have time. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm driving there right now. So I kind of, I calmed down about it. And then later on, Sam texts me, uh, guess who walked into his restaurant? Neil Gaiman and Amanda Palmer and a bunch of people. So Sam got to cook for them. And the chef of Sam's restaurant brought Amanda Palmer back into the kitchen to meet all the cooks. And he said to her, uh, your husband is Sam's favorite author. And, you know, I think of that moment all the time when I think of the importance we put on reading. Do you think anybody in that moment cared one iota that Sam didn't read when school and society expects children to read, you know? It kind of puts it all in perspective, you know, what really matters in the long run? What story do we want our children to own about their journey to reading? And I think my kids' stories are amazing. And I think if even if Sam had said, if conversation had come around to Sam talking to Neil Gaiman and Amanda Palmer about when he learned to read, I think they would have been fascinated and in awe themselves, you know? So uh, I, just, I just love holding on to that perspective. I really love that perspective too, because the, 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 journey is uh what matters it does the timing of it the expectations um from outside surrounding it none of that really matters the whole point is is their their journey and where they are and and how they uh bring reading into their lives maybe it becomes a big piece of it maybe it doesn't but it's all about uh, their life and their wishes and their needs so that's just beautiful yeah that's exactly it and i just have wanted to say also that i've referenced this before in the conference talk um that is available on your website, the Toronto Unschooling Conference Talk, What's What is So Radical About Radical Unschooling? I talk about uh, in a time when um, I had casually asked Sam if he was opposed to anything having to do with reading because he had groaned about um, reading directions on a box or something, a brownies that he wanted to make or something. And that's really a, a good thing if you want to listen to that talk because um, – Maybe our kids don't want to read. You know what I mean, and uh, and it doesn't matter if they. Uh, it, it doesn't matter one way or the other. It's not that they can't read or whatever. Maybe they just don't want to read right now. Like I said, Sam's enjoying having audiobooks being read to him. So, um, you know, that's just a matter of personal desire sometimes. I know, and and it's just our fears wrapped up in the expectations, like that we take the, uh, you know, I don't feel like reading a box right now, and we're like, oh my God, they're never going to like reading, right? right? right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, I know. And, that's, and it's, it's just, and that's why we, you know, we offer to help, and it was just so funny because that one day I was just joking, and I talk him to talk about, I had to examine it myself if it was a loaded question, you know, did, did I mean it to not be a joke and everything? So I, I looked at as we should always do, look at what we are owning and what we are handing to our children. So, And as you, you mentioned audiobooks, because I'll just add too that um, that's been something that Michael and I have really connected over because um, I'm driving him into town. It's like uh, 10, 15 minutes away, the dojo. And we go most nights of the week. And uh, he and I listen to audiobooks in and out. We're listening to Everything is Illuminated right now. Oh, cool. And, you know, it's just something, something that, that really, uh, we can connect over and share experience with, and it doesn't have to be about reading yet. You know what? Um, a few days ago, he, he likes to skateboard, longboard or bike into town every once in a while. And, uh, he's been hanging out at the library now when they were younger, we used to go a lot and I had a library card and we'd come out with, you know, tons and tons of books. Um, although at that time he wasn't reading, so it wasn't, 
you know, he would come and hang out because it was a fun place and he might play on the computer. Um, but books weren't a, a big thing for him at the time. And uh, the other day he's like, oh, I spent an hour in the library reading such and such a book. Mm-hmm. And, and I said, hey, you know, you could get your own card and bring it home. <laughs> <laughs> and the next time he went, he did. He signed up for card and he came home with the, the book. And uh, it, it was just pretty funny. And uh, he had almost finished it. So he finished it, in, you know, like two days later. And then yesterday he was going in, getting a ride with a friend into town. He's like, oh, let me grab the book. And he took it back and he came home with another one. And it's like, <laughs> cool. age doesn't what matter. It's their own. The library. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, and I, <clears throat> my library is 18 minutes away from home, and on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I come home for lunch. And so I get about 80 minutes of somebody reading me a book in that one day, and that's fantastic. And I always, I'm also testing books that way, you know, because I know my patrons and I know what they like and everything. So um, when I, I'm, I'm a library director who doesn't read a book often, a physical book, because I fall asleep when I start to read it. And my life is so busy with other things once I don't have my library director hat on. So the audiobooks is just so perfect, and I can talk about it you know, with the patrons and everything. And so I, I just love it. I love having it read to me. It's got to be the right reader though, you know? Oh, that really helps. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I want to thank you. So- oh, go ahead. No, no, I'm done. You're done. <laughs> I wanted to thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me today because, you know, I guess we could go on forever and ever, but I just love, love, love talking about reading with you. Yeah, I know. It's been so fun. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I loved it. Uh, Me too. And before you go, where's the best place for people to connect with you online? Uh, Well, I am always on the Shine With Unschooling Yahoo list. I have a Shine With Unschooling Facebook page. And um, I'd like to, oh, I'm going to have a Shine With Unschooling website up soon. But I would love to connect with people in real life at our Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summits. That would be fun. Oh, that's a good one. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, and I will include links to all those things in the show notes. Well, thank you very much, and hope you have a great day. Thank you, Pam. You too. Bye, everyone. I hope you found this episode helpful on your unschooling journey. And be sure to check out the growing podcast archive. The conversations never go out of date. You can find more information about my books, the Living Joyfully Network online community, and the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit online course at my website, livingjoyfully.ca.